Thank you, I hope you said something nice about me. <laughs> Don't you wish you could have a lunch like that every single day of your lives? It'd be wonderful, it was very excellent food. I suspect that many of you are confused about soy foods. And that's the reason many of you here today, if you're not at least a little bit confused about soy, you may not have access to the internet. Because if, if you do any searching about soy online, you're going to find a lot of conflicting information. Some of it claims that soy foods are poison. Other information suggests that soy foods are miracle foods. One thing is for sure, because there are 40,000 scientific articles that have been published involving soy foods, if you selectively use the data, if what we say cherry pick the data, you can say just about anything you want about soy foods. So when you read a blog post that suggests soy foods or claims soy foods are very harmful and it has lots of references, what you probably don't recognize if you don't spend a lot of time reading about soy is that for every reference that may suggest soy is harmful in some way, there are 10 or 20 references that are saying it's perfectly safe and beneficial. So when I reach conclusions about the health effects of soy foods, I base my conclusions on the totality of the evidence and I pay special attention to the type of study that was conducted and the quality of that study. So you have to look at all of the evidence and give certain weight to different types of studies. Another thing we know for certain is that mice and rats are not little humans. So although animal studies are part of the scientific literature, they really carry relatively little weight, or certainly they should carry relatively little scientific weight. And I think this point is starting to make its way into the scientific community. We have a really excellent review paper that looked at the value of animal studies for predicting effects in humans and the authors concluded that animal models are not predictive or predictors of human response. So as I go through the literature today, I'm going to be placing my emphasis and basing my conclusions on the human research. That's the epidemiologic studies, which are often referred to as population studies, and most importantly, on the clinical studies these are the intervention studies, the types of studies that are really considered to be the gold standard. And by the way, if you email me, and I believe my email is on the last slide, if not, I will, I will say it. If you email me, you can have a PDF of my slides today, as well as a PDF of my slides from my presentation yesterday, so you don't have to worry so much about taking notes. Oh. Well, thank you, that I didn't, it was completely unexpected. Um, so there are two types of traditional Asian soy foods. The unfermented ones, edamame or the green soybeans, tofu is a good example of an unfermented food, and then soy milk, soy drink, that's made from whole soybeans. Fermented foods include miso, which is often consumed as a soup, tempeh, which was really um, created in Indonesia, and natto, which is a fermented whole soybean that is consumed in the eastern regions in Japan. And one of the strangest things you'll see online is that Asians only consume fermented soy foods. Well, that would be 
surprising news to the more than one billion Chinese people on this earth, because when you actually look at the studies, they're very clear that in China and in Singapore and in Hong Kong, countries with Chinese ethnicities, what you see is almost all of the soy consumed is in unfermented form, primarily as tofu and then also as soy milk. In Japan, where unferment or where fermented foods are consumed, the most popular one is miso, you still find about 50% of the soy being consumed in unfermented form as tofu. So it's very strange. Both of these foods are consumed throughout the Asian community, but most people in the world actually get their soy in unfermented form. You also hear that Asians consume very little soy. That's not true at all. In Shanghai, which is a high soy consuming region within China, you find the average being about one and a half to two servings per day. And people in the upper 25 or 30% of intake are consuming about three servings per day. In Japan, the average is about one and a half to two servings per day. It provides about 10% to 15% of their total protein intake. Now, much of the controversy about soy foods is because they are uniquely rich sources of a group of naturally occurring plant chemicals called isoflavones. Isoflavones have been widely and very intensely studied for their potential health benefits. And you can see very clearly that soy foods are uniquely rich sources of these compounds if you look at this slide, you can see average isoflavone intake in Japan is about 30 to 50 milligrams per day, whereas in Europe, it's less than two milligrams per day. So if you consume a diet that contains soy foods, your diet is high in isoflavones. If you don't consume soy, your diet is almost completely lacking in isoflavones. By comparison, one serving of a soy traditional soy food, such as 250 milliliters of soy milk or 100 grams of tofu, provide about 25 milligrams of isoflavones. So you can see Europeans are really not consuming much soy, although I'm happy to say that soy foods are increasing in popularity. So let's take a quick look at isoflavones. Even if you don't have any kind of organic chemistry background, what you can see from this slide is that isoflavones have a somewhat similar chemical structure to the hormone estrogen. As a result, the isoflavones in soybeans are able to bind to estrogen receptors on cells, and because of that, they're able to exert estrogen-like effects under certain experimental conditions. And for that reason, isoflavones are commonly referred to as phytoestrogens or plant estrogens. Although the isoflavones are classified as phytoestrogens, they are very different from the hormone estrogen. And in fact, sometimes isoflavones will have effects opposite to those of estrogen. And it's really easy to understand how two molecules with a similar chemical structure can have opposite physiological effects when you consider the case of cholesterol and phytosterols. Cholesterol is found in animal products. Phytosterols are found in many plant foods, including soybeans. These two molecules have almost identical chemical structures. Cholesterol found in animal foods, raises blood cholesterol. Phytosterols, found in plant foods, lowers blood cholesterol levels. Similar chemical structures, opposite physiological effects. Sometimes isoflavones won't have any effects on tissues that are affected by estrogen. And isoflavones can also have effects 
that are unrelated to the hormone estrogen. The point here is that even though isoflavones are classified as phytoestrogens, plant estrogens, they are very different from the hormone estrogen. Okay, let's take a look now at our first topic. Can soy foods be safely consumed by breast cancer patients? Now, you may find it somewhat surprising that this is a controversy, that there would be concern about breast cancer patients consuming soy foods when you can see from this slide that countries where soy foods are consumed have very low rates of breast cancer. But this kind of observational data doesn't carry a lot of scientific weight among nutritionists and physicians you really need to look toward other types of data if you're going to resolve this controversy. So why is the there a controversy about soy consumption by breast cancer patients? The reason is because traditionally it's been thought that exposure to the hormone estrogen increases breast cancer risk and worsens the prognosis of breast cancer patients. But that thinking is actually quite outdated. Recently, the US Preventative Services Task Force evaluated the relationship between estrogen and breast cancer risk, <clears throat> and they concluded that the use of estrogen alone results in a small reduction in the risk for developing or dying of breast cancer. And that conclusion is not surprising because that conclusion reflects the results of the Women's Health Initiative trial. This is the largest trial conducted, ever conducted of its kind. It involved 10,000 women. 5,000 women were given a placebo. 5,000 women were given estrogen. Regardless of the age at which women were when they were enrolled in the study, women who consumed estrogen were less likely to develop breast cancer. Nevertheless, there is data, there are data showing that in a particular animal model, isoflavones will stimulate the growth of a certain type of breast tumor. Now, I've already given you my perspective on animal studies, I don't think they are at all useful for providing insight into human nutrition. But for a while, all we had were the animal data. We didn't have the human data that could refute the results from this animal study. Now we do, however. We've had it for about 15 years now. Now, we don't have any clinical trials that have actually given one group of placebo or, say, milk protein, and another group of breast cancer patients soy, and then look to see if the breast cancer patients given soy are more or less likely to die from their disease or more or less likely to suffer a recurrence of their disease. So we don't have those kind of trials. But what we do have are lots and lots of trials that have evaluated the effects of soy foods or isoflavones on markers or indicators of breast cancer risk. So an indicator of breast cancer risk is breast tissue density. And you can measure the density of the breast by taking a mammogram. Breasts that are more dense are less likely or more likely to develop a tumor. We also have studies that have actually taken a biopsy of the breast before exposure to soy, and then taken a biopsy after exposure to soy foods, and looked at how fast the cells are replicating. Cells that replicate more quickly are more likely to be transformed into a cancer cell because they have less, less time to repair any damage to DNA. What these studies show consistently, I mean totally consistently, 
is that neither soy nor isoflavones have any adverse effect, any negative effect on breast tissue. These studies have involved healthy women, women at a high risk of developing breast cancer, and breast cancer patients. So this is a very powerful argument for the safety of soy foods for breast cancer patients. So it's not surprising that very recently, the European Food Safety Authority concluded that isoflavones don't adversely affect breast tissue in postmenopausal women. This is a very important report that was published a few months ago. Interestingly, the, Europe, your, the European Food Safety Authority examined the relationship between isoflavones and breast tissue at the request of the BFR in Germany. And after a multi-year comprehensive evaluation, EFSA concluded that isoflavones don't adversely affect breast tissue. Not surprisingly, the American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research have concluded that soy foods can be safely consumed by breast cancer patients. But there's something even more interesting. Recently, the World Cancer Research Fund International concluded that soy foods may improve the survival of breast cancer patients. So if you consume soy after a diagnosis of your disease, you will benefit as a result. Now, what did they base their conclusion on? They based their conclusion on a statistical analysis of five population studies. Here we have the conclusion of the authors of this analysis, and then I'll provide a few details about the study. Consuming soy after a diagnosis of breast cancer is associated with reduced recurrence and increased survival. So we've gone from the animal studies in the 1990s that caused oncologists to advise their breast cancer patients to avoid soy to the human research suggesting that soy may actually be beneficial for breast cancer patients. So this analysis included five studies, two from the United States, three from China. It involved 11,000 women with breast cancer, so it's a large number of patients. They were followed from four to seven years. So they enrolled in the study, they looked at what they were consuming, and they recorded their intake for a number of years. During that time, there were almost 1,000 deaths due to breast cancer, and almost, almost 1,500 women had a recurrence of their disease. And very simply, they found that consuming about two servings of soy after a diagnosis of breast cancer reduces risk of dying from breast cancer by 16% and reduces risk of recurrence by about 24%. And I'm happy to say that this information is starting to make its way into the medical community. This was a question, a clinical inquiry that was um, published in a journal that targets physicians, the Journal of Family Practice. Does high dietary soy intake affect a woman's risk of developing breast cancer or recurring breast cancer in breast cancer patients? And they reflected the results of the study I just presented. Consuming a diet high in soy is associated with a 25% decrease in cancer recurrence and a 15% decrease in mortality. Now, I don't have time to discuss the role of soy in preventing breast cancer, but there is substantial evidence indicating that if young girls, teenage girls, consume about one serving of soy foods per day, they will reduce their risk substantially later on in life. I don't think that adult soy intake reduces risk. I do think if you consume soy when you're young, your risk will be reduced. Now, this topic is one that I am personally and professionally interested in because I consume soy on a daily basis. That's feminization of men. It's not surprising that there would be concern about feminization because we know that isoflavones are classified as phytoestrogens or plant estrogens. People think of estrogen, and it is the female reproductive hormone, but you may be surprised to learn 
that older men actually make more estrogen than older women do. So there are two case reports describing two individuals in the literature indicating that excessive amounts of soy can possibly lead to some feminizing effects. One is the case of a 19-year-old vegan who experienced a decrease in testosterone levels and a loss of sexual drive. The other one is a 60-year-old man. But here's what you need to know. The vegan was consuming 12 to 20 servings of soy per day, and the older man was consuming three liters of soy milk per day. If you consume that much cow's milk, that much beef, you're going to run into a lot of problems. So this really doesn't provide any meaningful insight into the health effects of soy. It's due to a re consuming a ridiculous amount of soy. And those were case reports. Just keep that thought in mind for a moment. A moment. This is another case report in which the investigators actually gave a man with low sperm concentration isoflavones from soybeans. It raised his sperm concentration. As a result, the couple was able to have a child. And the investigators are suggesting that isoflavones may be a treatment for low sperm concentration. So you've got two case reports showing excessive soy intake could be harmful. One showing isoflavones may be beneficial, but these are all case reports. And as you can see on this slide, case reports are not a very credible type of evidence. They are often used to generate hypotheses, but then you need to take that information and evaluate it in a more sophisticated and more rigorous way. And fortunately, that has been done. So here we have the results of a statistical analysis of clinical studies, the gold standard, intervention studies. This analysis involved over 30 studies, looked at the effects of soy and isoflavones on testosterone levels. Here we have a comprehensive review that looked at the animal studies, the epidemiologic studies, the intervention or clinical studies, looked at the general issue of male feminization. And here's what we see from these studies. There's no effect of soy, even large amounts, even up to six or seven servings per day, and I think no one should be consuming more than four servings per day, no matter how healthful any food is, you don't want to place too much emphasis on any single food. So these studies show no effect of soy on testosterone levels, Free testosterone means or refers to the biologically active form of testosterone. No effects on estrogen levels, no effects on sperm or semen. The clinical data are extremely reassuring. Now, what you also see on the internet, incredibly, is that soy may adversely affect fertility. It may impair Fertility. Well, the first thing you might think of is, well, there seem to be a lot of people in countries that consume soy foods on a regular basis. And in fact, if you look at the studies, what we see, a recent study, probably published about five months ago, found that soy intake by men had no impact on the ability of women, the partner of the man, to uh, have a live birth after in vitro fertilization. So no harmful effects of soy consumption on fertility. And here we see a study actually suggesting that soy foods may negate, may negate the harmful effects of BPA on reproduction. So BPA, bisphenol A, is classified as an endocrine disruptor, uh, something that can disrupt your normal hormone balance it's a compound that is used in the making of plastics. So it's very prevalent in the environment. This research showed that in women who had high levels of BPA, high exposure to BPA, they were less likely to have a live birth after in vitro fertilization. But if they were consuming soy foods, there was no adverse effect of BPA. 
So in contrast to the internet nonsense, the clinical research, the epidemiologic research, is very reassuring. There are no adverse effects of soy on men or on fertility. What about thyroid function? Another big one on the internet. I published a review of 14 clinical studies in 2006, so it's a decade ago. But at that time, it was very clear that there were no effects of isoflavones or soy foods, even large amounts of isoflavones, on thyroid, on thyroid function in people with normal functioning thyroids. After that research, or after my review was published, many studies have confirmed those findings, and I just want to highlight this one from the University of Messina, no relationship, it's just a, gen a genetic connection. I wasn't involved with the study um, in, in Italy. I want to point out this study or highlight this study because it was three years in duration. Very few nutrition-related clinical studies, intervention studies, ever go for as long as three years. One year is considered a long time for a clinical study involving diet. So three years, large number of women, and they used a very high dose of isoflavones, equivalent to about four servings of soy foods, and they used very sensitive measures to assess thyroid function, not just thyroid hormones, but other measures as well, and they found no effects of isoflavones on thyroid function. And that also is the conclusion of the European Food Safety Authority. Isoflavones don't adversely affect thyroid function in postmenopausal women. Now, what about soy and hypothyroid patients? These are individuals that have low normal, low uh, thyroid function, and as a result, they take medication, they take thyroid hormone. Well, it is quite possible that soy protein interferes with the absorption of the medication. So it's not an effect on the thyroid, it's an effect on the absorption of the medication. But soy is by no means alone in this regard. Calcium supplements have this effect, fiber supplements have this effect, iron supplements have this effect, a number of different types of drugs and herbs have this effect as well. So soy foods are not contraindicated for hypothyroid patients. That is, hypothyroid patients taking thyroid medication can consume soy foods. It is recommended, however, that you uh, separate the time from which you take the thyroid medication and when you're actually consuming soy foods. Now, generally, you take thyroid medication on a fasting or empty stomach, so I would recommend waiting one, two, three hours after consuming the drug before you consume soy foods. Alternatively, because you can just take more of the drug, if you want to consume soy foods at breakfast, and I use soy milk on my cereal in the morning, then you may have to just increase your dosage of the medication uh, which is a very simple process if you consult with your physician. Mineral absorption, phytate. Phytate is a naturally occurring plant compound. It's found in whole grains and beads and uh, beans and seeds, including soy foods and soybeans. It's a storage form of the mineral phosphorus for plants. Now there is no question that phytate decreases or inhibits to some extent the absorption of minerals such as calcium, iron, and zinc. But as you know, all nutritionists recommend whole grains. They appear to be quite healthful, and whole grains are loaded, have large amounts of phytate. So simply because something has phytate, there's no reason to stop uh, consuming that food. Soy also has a compound called oxalate in it. Oxalate is found in many different foods. It binds the mineral calcium. So if you look at spinach, 
It's very, very rich in calcium. It has a very high concentration amount of calcium, but it's not a good source of that mineral because the oxalate in spinach reduces the absorption of calcium. So what do we know about soy and mineral absorption? Very surprisingly, and if you actually talk to the experts who um, conduct this type of research, despite the fact that soy contains phytate and oxalate, two components that hib inhibit calcium absorption, the absorption of calcium from soy milk that's fortified with calcium and the absorption of calcium from tofu that's made by using, by coagulating the soy milk with the calcium salt, the calcium absorption from those foods is as good as the calcium absorption is from cow's milk. What about iron? First of all, plant-based diets are very high in iron. They're higher in iron than uh, meat-based diets. You don't need much, much meat to meet your iron requirements, so unless you actually are a vegan, it's not going to be a concern. If you're a vegan, you would want to be sure to consume vitamin C at each meal because vitamin C enhances the absorption of iron. But there's something interesting about the type of iron in soy. The type of iron in soy is called ferritin, and recent research suggests that iron in the form of ferritin is not actually influenced by typical inhibitors of iron absorption. So newer methodology is suggesting that iron from so soy is actually absorbed very, very well. Another really very fascinating point that I want to make, and I was surprised to see this finding, but the study was done extremely well. If you consume soy habitually, excuse me, if you consume a high phytate diet over a long period of time, say a few weeks, a few months, you adapt to the effect of phytate on mineral absorption. So let me repeat that. If you do a acute study, a short-term study, and you give someone phytate, it will inhibit the absorption of their minerals. If you give them phytate for a few weeks or a few months, the ability of phytate to inhibit iron absorption is greatly diminished. So this is something that applies not just to soy, but to a vegan or plant-based diet in general. What about the effect of soy on puberty? Again, this question is being raised because soy contains plant estrogens. And one thing we do know is that around the world, there is a trend toward earlier pubertal development. And this is very clear in countries that consume soy as well as in countries that don't consume soy. And you can really see how dramatic this change has been. If you look at the countries shown here, if we start with the Netherlands, between 1965 and 2009, the age at which girls started to menstruate, the age of menses, decreased from 13.4 down to 12.6. In the UK, over a longer period of time, it went from 13.5 years to 12.3 years. Some really dramatic changes. In Korea, over a 65-year period, it went from almost 17 years, so girls began menstruating at the age of 17 in 1920. Now they have menses at the age of 13.8. So there, does, there has to be a reason for why this change is occurring. One of the problems or disadvantages of an earlier puberty is that it increases risk of breast cancer. Now, again, I already mentioned it, but I don't have time to share with you the data. There's a lot of very encouraging evidence indicating that consuming soy early in life reduces breast cancer risk. So you wouldn't think soy would cause puberty to occur, occur early in, earlier in life if soy is reducing risk of breast cancer. Nevertheless, one of the hypotheses is that 
this change in the age at which puberty occurs is due to exposure to hormonally active chemicals in the environment. It could be BPA that I talked about before, bisphenol A, an endocrine disruptor that's used in plastics. But because there are isoflavones in soy foods, people have asked the question of whether isoflavones affect puberty in boys and girls. Well, I was actually involved in a study that was conducted uh, at Loma Linda University. It was published very recently. We looked at the effect of soy consumption on the age of menses, when girls begin to menstruate. Now, it's very difficult to conduct population studies in Western countries and expect to get meaningful insight about the health effects of soy because, as I've already mentioned, soy consumption is relatively low in non-Asian countries. But of course, as I'm sure you recognize, Seventh-day Adventists are a high soy consuming population. About 40% of the Adventists are vegetarians. So this study involved 327 Seventh-day Adventist girls. The average intake among the girls was almost two servings per day, so that's quite a bit. 20% of the girls consumed at least three servings per, that should be per day, not week, excuse me. So 20% consumed at least three servings of soy per day. And then they looked at the effect of soy on the age of menarche, completely unrelated. It had no effect on when girls began menstruating. And I think this is my uh, final topic, and that's allergy. Many proteins found in foods cause allergic reactions. In the United States, soy is considered one of the big eight. These are the eight foods that are responsible for 90% of the food allergies. But these foods are not equally allergenic. Some of these foods cause more allergies than other foods. And the largest survey of its kind found that only about one out of every 2,500 adults have a doctor-diagnosed soy allergy. So it's actually quite rare. And in this study of 38,000 children, although allergy to soy was more common than in adults, which is not unexpected because children are more allergic to food than adults are, what we see here is that the rates were still very low and the uh, prevalence of allergy to cow's milk was five times greater than the prevalence of allergy to soy milk or soy foods, and peanut allergy was four times more common. So there is allergic, there are allergies to soy, but they're actually quite rare. And about 70% of the children who are initially allergic to soy will outgrow their soy allergy by the age of 10. So when you look at the totality of the evidence and you place appropriate emphasis on the type of study and give the most weight to the human research, what you find is that soy foods are perfectly safe and promote health. They provide high quality protein, similar in quality to animal protein. Soy protein lowers cholesterol levels. It may lower blood pressure. The fat in soy is very heart healthy high in polyunsaturated fat. It provides both essential fatty acids. It's a uniquely rich source of isoflavones. If you consume soy early in life, it may reduce your risk of breast cancer, may increase the amount of calcium in your bones. It reduces hot flashes. There's new research suggesting that isoflavones improve mental health. I have a paper coming out probably within the next month on that topic, and it may decrease risk of prostate cancer. So thank you very much for your attention. And there's my email if you want the slides. <laughs>